Okay, so good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I can always count on you, Phil. Uh, <laughs> all right, we're working our way through the Revelation. We are in the section on the, the, the seven churches. Um, just to kind of reiterate, these were seven uh, literal churches in seven cities along a postal route. Uh, in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Um, each of these churches is, I mean, it's a real place with real issues that uh, Christ addresses. You can think of these as seven more like epistles. You know, you got the book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians. These are written by Paul to a church. Well, these are letters written by Jesus to a church. And so who better to know what they need to hear than the one who stands among the seven lampstands we saw in Revelation 1, which represented those churches. And he has something unique to say to each of them, relate, you know, based specifically on what's going on there. We've also talked about it, the fact that there's somewhere, you know, probably north of 100 churches at this point in history. And he doesn't write to 100, he writes to seven a very common number in Revelation, but these seven churches really represent churches throughout all of the church age. Um, and you can see these churches, you can identify that one's really, really like Sardis, or that one's really like Smyrna. But you also can take a church, like our church, and say, hey, we have a little too much Laodicea in us, and address that, and go to the book and say, What's the what's the com, you know what's the the command to Laodicea? How should I be addressing that? And you can do that personally as well. I mean, these are personally applicable. If you find yourself being described in one of these, listen to what the Lord of the Church has to say on that issue. This morning we come to the church at Philippi. It's the almost the last. It's the second to the last church we'll come to. Um, I wanted to mention, I will cover it right at the end, but uh, we talked last week about how starting in um, about Pergamos, you started seeing fewer and fewer and fewer believers in these churches. We talked about that last week. And that is a pattern that runs through four, five, and seven, <laughs> but this one is the exception to that. And I'm just gonna draw that point out now and you'll, you'll see that as we go and how that kind of plays in, I think. Um, this one is not quite the longest, but it's almost the longest letter. And it's, I think, at least I found it far more complex than the others. So we're gonna move more rapidly <laughs> maybe than we have before. And you'll notice by prior week questions in this sheet, we have like 17 things to get through this morning. So let me stop uh, dilly-dallying and get get straight in. All right. Be reminded, last thing before we jump in, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the primary point every week is what am I learning new about Jesus this week from this letter? What, what am I seeing about him that I either have known but I see it in a new light or something to that effect? This book is revealing Christ for who he really is. This is the letter to the church, we've mentioned it multiple times when it says, and to the angel, that the word is messenger. It's often translated angel, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an angel. Uh, this angelos, messenger, word, is used of John the Baptist, and so it doesn't always mean angel. It's been translated that way. We spent quite a bit of time. We actually think these are seven people from these seven churches who came to Patmos, my son Ryan asked a question last week um, about that, and I thought it was good to maybe address it. Each of these guys got the entire letter with all, I mean, meaning the entire book of Revelation, the entire scroll with all seven letters. So when they got back to their church, everybody got to hear exactly what you do, the whole thing. But they're specifically mentioned, and so they drop down, and what does he have to say to us? Okay. So it's not that each one of these churches only got this chunk. They all got all of it, but this part specifically is addressed to Philippi. So um, let me, uh, 
if I could have one of you that's over here somewhere close to the to this side read this for us to get it into our consciousness. Go ahead. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming to the whole world, to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never go, excuse me, never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God, out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you. So what we're going to do with this, we're going to break it into three chunks. This is the first section we'll look at, so we'll kind of zoom in on it here. So to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, we have seen, um, we've talked about this idea that it's actually a messenger. And our first question on the sheet is, what title does Jesus use? And every week what we find is that he pulls a reference from chapter 1. Uh, feet of burnished bronze, eyes like fire, whatever it would be. This one is the exception to that. There's one other where he has some he pulls from chapter 1, and then he has one other that's not. He changed from son of uh, man to son of God on one of them. This one is really, all of it is from Old Testament references. It's not really even connected to chapter 1. So it's somewhat unique in that way. Um, it says, the word of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. So to summarize that, the, the answer would be the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and shuts. Otherwise you're writing <laughs> half a paragraph. So that is essentially what he's talking about. That's his title. And so we kind of want to work through what are each of these components of the title that he uses what are they a reference to? So the word of the Holy One. The Holy One is just very clearly a claim of deity. It is his statement that I am God. He is, there is only one Holy One. Uh, we can have holiness about us as we emulate Christ, but no one is the Holy One other than God. And so for him to say he is the Holy One, this is clearly a reference of him being God. What is meant by the true one? Um, in the Old Testament, you'll see God say, I am holy and true. Uh, it's just another way of referencing that same kind of thing. But it's also a genuine one. And he will later reference the synagogue of Satan who claim to be but are liars or who are lying. And he is the true one or the genuine one. <clears throat> so that's a contrast to something he mentions later. And then he says, uh, who has the key of David. And we want to see what is that a reference to. So here's a verse where, uh, in Luke 1. This is famous. We've all seen this. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Um, this was said to Mary uh, by the angel in Luke 1. So this idea of him having the key of David is really a statement about he is in that Davidic line. It's his kingly role. Um, is what's being referenced here. There's a, there's a passage in the, um, Isaiah, I think, where it talks about 
um, having keys to the treasure house of the king. Um, so the point is this, this key is related to his kingly role on David's throne, which is referenced here in Luke 1, but it's also he has control and access to all that is God's abundance. Um, so it's a, and he, he starts to unfold that with some of these coming comments about that what he opens, no one can close, that what he closes, no one can open, things of that nature. So I think the way to summarize this one is Christ is sovereign. That's his reference back to the kingly part. And I think it's actually a, it's a reference to his millennial reign. Um, he is coming as that, but he will rule from David's, King David's throne. It is, it, it has more than that, but that is a component of what's being described here. He then goes to um, one who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Um, I'll put that back in case anybody still needs to write. Um, this idea of opening and shutting it really is just a, a continuation of this idea about sovereignty. Um, it's his statement of, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and there ain't nobody going <laughs> to, bad grammar, but good theology, right? Uh, there's no one that's going to stop him. Um, there's a famous passage in Daniel where it's, you know, the, the people of the earth are as grasshoppers, and no one can stay his hand. It's that same kind of comment here. He's going to do what he's going to do, and there's no one that can stop that from happening. How do there's the doors to heaven? The door to heaven that um, you can open it for who he wants and close it to those he does. Yeah, I think there's that. Um, it is that. And it is also about, I think we'll see as it unfolds, uh, the advancement of his church. Because uh, he specifically says, I've opened the door for you, and it has reference to evangelism. But yes, ultimately it is those who are going to come in are at his discretion. He, he is the one that opens that door um, and no one can stop them kind of a thing. So I do think it is a reference to um, salvation and his kingdom, things of that nature. But this idea of the advancement of his church, no one can stop him from advancing his church. When he wants to do a work in an area where it's not legal, it doesn't matter. He does it anyway. <laughs> um, you know, there something in the neighborhood of 300 million Chinese Christians in the world, you know, in China. And uh, that's not something that's supposed to happen, but no one's going to stop it. When he opens the door, it opens. So that's part of what's being described here. And it's just, an, again, it's a continuation of, of him expre expressing his sovereignty over how the world is, is working. So as we move then into kind of the main body of the letter, it's this section that we're seeing. And so we'll zoom in on that a little bit so that the text is bigger. He says to them, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. This is really kind of the main section of the letter. You have your opening. This is the, the body of the letter, so to speak. And then he has a concluding thought at the end. This is really kind of the main part we want to take time on this morning. Each week we have several questions we ask every week. One of them is, what was Philadelphia doing right? Um, so that would be our next thing we'd want to look at. It says, I know your works. 
Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So what would you say to what are they doing right? Keeping his word and not denying his name. That's it, really, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting. It's not a big, long list like we've seen in other churches, right? I mean, the church that gets the hammer dropped on them, but uh, if I'm remembering right, is like Thyatira. And they've got, you know, Jezebel, and they're into the deep things of Satan and all this other stuff. I mean, he had this laundry list of, I know your works and your faith and your faithfulness and your blah, 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 and your love and your, it's just like goes on and on about it. And then he drops the hammer on him, right? This, it's like, it's kind of, unusual. it's almost unusual in light of that. Um, I know your works. Okay, what are they? Then he switches gears. Behold, I have set before you an open door. He doesn't really address their good works. He, I've got opportunity I'm going to give you. I think that's connected. It's because of their good works he's opening more opportunity. There's a big thing, I think, to be learned there. Um, when we're faithful with a little, he gives us more <laughs> opportunity. There's something to be said there. Um, and when he does that, no one's able to shut that opportunity. Then he addresses the fact that I know that you have but little power. This is actually a small church. It's a very small community. It's, it's not a big, it's not Ephesus or, you know what I mean? It's not one of the biggies. This is Ossian, you know, this kind of a thing. This is a, this is a little thing. That's what he means by little power. It's not that their power from him is reduced. It's that they're small. They're a small group. Go ahead. It reminds me of, and I, I forget where it was, but the guys that uh, were a small army. Yeah. And they carried the light under the baskets yeah. in the middle of the night and yeah. scared a huge army. Yeah, yeah. They had but little power, but they yeah. had faith in God. And then they contrast that to the guys that came back at, that when Moses was with them and they went to the Holy Land and came back and said, no, it's yeah. no good. They can't do this. They disobeyed. They didn't yeah. have faith in his power. Yeah. So despite the fact that they have this little power, they're outnumbered dramatically in the setting they're in, and yet you have kept my word, obedience, that's what that's talking about, kept my word means they're being obedient, and you have not denied my name. They've not denied what is representative of his name, meaning they're not, it's not saying like, Peter, when he, oh, I don't know him, I don't think that's what that means there. I think it's more of they've not denied who he is and all that's encompassed by his name is really what's being stated there. So I have this, despite having little power, they have kept his word and have not denied his name. That's what they're doing right. <clears throat> and really, it's like, that's pretty simple. I mean, that's not, it's not, you know, you guys are a great missionary church who have people scattered all over the globe doing these powerful, mighty works of miracle. You know, no, no, they were obedient. They were faithful. That's it. Well, the first part of that would describe each one of us yeah. having little power. Absolutely. And that's our big excuse. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I have but little power, but I'm obedient and I'm faithful. Okay. Now, Keep that here, front, front and center, as we continue to move through this letter. Again, Thyatira, their works are even greater now than at the beginning, right? Um, Ephesians, or the church at Ephesus, they are rooting out false doctrine. I mean, they are on the march. They're doing great things, but they've lost their first love. You know what I'm saying? He's got this word of correction to all these churches that have a laundry list of good stuff. These guys are obedient and faithful. Obedient and faithful. Even though they have very little power. What is meant by, I have set before you an open door that no one is able to shut? That's the section that it comes from. It's just, it's the fact that Christ is sovereign, again, sovereignty, sovereign over evangelism. When Christ opens a door for ministry, it is open and it cannot be shut. 
I know that you have but little power. We've talked about that. And yet you have kept my word, or kept my yeah, word and not denied my name. So if we move to the next section, it says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. That one's kind of confusing. So let me just quickly address first, and then we'll go to the second part of this. What is this synagogue of Satan? who say they're Jews but are not. What, what is that talking about? Are these, are these Gentiles who are saying we're Jews? I mean, there are folks in the world who do that today. Um, they, they would claim that the, the, the Jewish nation has been lost and these people migrated up over the Caucasus Mountains and, and so that's Caucasians and it's this whole weird thing. So if you ever hear that, just turn around and run. <laughs> Um, it, it's part of like, you know, Aryan nation type stuff. All right. I don't think that's what's being addressed here. I think what's talk, being talked about here is when you go to Galatians, it says that the promise is made to Abraham and his seed, not <coughs> seeds, singular. I mean, it actually gets into a grammar lesson in, in Galatians. And it says that all who are in the seed of Abraham, which is Christ, are of Abraham doesn't mean when you get saved you become Jewish. Again, this is not we've replaced Israel. That's not what's being described. What's being described is that there are Jews that are not Jews by faith. They are Jews by blood. There are others of us who are not Jews by blood, but we're Jews kind of by faith. It doesn't mean we become Jewish. It means we're now children of Abraham by being like him in faith. What these guys are doing is they are actually blood Jews who have denied the faith of Abraham. They've denied the, the, the God of Abraham by denying the one he sent. That's what's being referenced here. Um, and then when, that makes more sense then when you see this. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. Who is the you? That's the Gentiles who are in Philadelphia, right? So this is the Jews, the real gods on our side, right? That's a very, that's a very, that's something they're really proud of, which is, that's good, that the one true God is the God of Israel, but the one true God has now had Jesus come into the world and they've rejected him, rejected God, and now they have Jesus, true God, is come to Gentiles. And the Gentiles are now accepting the one true God. And what he's talking about here is, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, meaning acknowledge you're right. He's, he really is the true God. Today, what you would call this is a Messianic Jew. A Jew who's truly a Jew by blood, who recognizes, you know what, you guys are right. Jesus really was the Messiah. It's not literally a coming and bowing down before feet and worshiping some. It's not that. It's acknowledging the truthfulness of what the Gentiles are saying, which is this Jesus is really God. And we know that because he says, and they will learn, I have loved you. So, and what's interesting here is that's true of good churches. They tend to treat the Jewish people well. They tend to have an outreach or a mission to Jewish um, people because we see them as folks that God loves and would want to bring into the family. And we know that Romans tells us eventually all of Israel will be saved and they will at a point in the future. Um, so anytime you hear churches, and there's a lot of them today, who will um, say God is done with Israel. We are now spiritual Israel, and all the promises of Israel come to us. Turn and run <laughs> would be my admonition to you. Weren't Go ahead. There some Jews in that day that believed? Yes. And I would say in Philadelphia Gentiles, that. So it would be Jews and Gentiles. Yeah. And I would have a. In. I would believe that in Philadelphia <clears throat> there are Jews 
that have believed and have done what this is describing. Again, not coming in and bowing down and worshiping their Gentile brother, but saying, you know what, we had it wrong. You, you're right. Jesus really is our guy. And they're thrilled and they come in and now they're part of the family. Because remember, Paul says, now there is no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, right? He kind of breaks that all down and says, you are in Christ. So the fact that you're Jewish or Gentile is irrelevant if you're in Christ, but the fact that it's, okay, I'm Jewish, I don't want your Gentile God, Jesus. I'm going to worship Yahweh. Okay, they don't get, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the one at the burning bush. And I'm not saying there is another heresy out there, let me warn you of. It is that God is one and he shows up in different forms. He used to call himself Yahweh, then he called himself Jesus, and now he calls himself the Holy Spirit. That's, that's, a, that's a heresy. We worship the true God in three persons who have always existed. Let us make man in our image, plural pronouns for God. Because Jesus was before the foundation of the world. <laughs> the Holy Spirit was there. So we don't believe that there is a God that transitions from shape to shape, so to speak. And that is something that's held by some. It is heretical. Um, what we're saying is when Jesus is meeting um, Abraham, or excuse me, sometimes I get my Noah and the, these guys off, you know, Moses and the ark and that kind of stuff. So just, um, when he met Moses at the burning bush, um, we studied that at length. And it's I am is who's talking to you. And Jesus in the Gospels makes it very clear, I am. I am the I am. Before Abraham was, I am. That's not good grammar. It's really good doctrine. Jesus is not bad at grammar. He's making a very serious point there. So that's why I say Jesus is the I am of the Old Testament that was speaking to Moses. And who then later spoke to Joshua. Um, so the point is here, when, uh, when these Jews realize you guys were right, there's a kind of bowing of pride to say, we had it wrong, we shouldn't have killed our Messiah, I'm joining the true, I'm going to worship the true God. I really think that's what's happening there. And that fits with, I've opened a door for you, evangelism, to who? To the Jews. That's what I think is being addressed there. <clears throat> I jumped ahead and answered the question before I... It is saying he will use them to reach the Jews for salvation. That's what's being described there. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. To those who dwell on the earth. So what is meant by, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. Put our text back up here. Um, is that the tribulation period? That's what I believe that to be, and I believe that for a couple of reasons. One, it says an hour of trouble, or an hour of trial. It's a very distinct thing, but it's a very specific thing in terms of time. And then it's not a local thing. It is on the whole world. Everyone on the planet will be affected by this. So it can't be an earthquake, you know what I mean? It's, it can't be something of that nature. Um, but then we get to the end of that and it says uh, on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So I have a question here of let's figure that out first because I think that'll help. Who are those who dwell on the earth? If you just read it, this is like the first time we've run into this. So we wouldn't realize it, but this phrase dwell on the earth or earth dwellers different. It's, it's 
It's used like 10 or 11 times in Revelation. So we're going to take a quick, very quick, <clears throat> I only got three of them for you, but it makes the point pretty easily. In Revelation 6.10, they cried out with a loud voice, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true. Recognize that <laughs> from, his, from what we were just studying. Sovereign Lord, holy and true. The holy one, the true one. How long before you will judge and avenge our blood? These are the martyrs during the tribulation period, on those who dwell on the earth. Literally, same phrase, those who dwell on the earth. These are the ones who need... So the martyrs are asking, when are you going to avenge us or avenge our blood on those who have killed us, those who dwell on the earth? Okay. Next one. Also, I was allowed, or it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. This is the beast. And authority was given over every tribe and people, language, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. I mentioned to you before that last phrase there real quick. It's mentioned seven times in the seven letters. My memory is, is that it's seven times throughout the book in addition to that as well. This is one of those. This is a everybody listen type of a comment here at the end. Also, last week we were talking about names not being blotted out of a book of life. I wanted to, This is the one I had in mind last week and I was going to try to find it for you. Um, everyone whose name who has not been written before the foundation of the world. So it's like, who is it that will populate the new heaven and the new earth? It, are, it is those whose names have been written from before the foundation. So in other words, there aren't people in 2072, the year 2072, having their name written in as a, oh yeah, we'll add you in. No. If it wasn't there before the foundation, it's not getting in. It goes back to sovereignty which we've dealt with that topic multiple times. I won't take the rabbit trail this morning. But what I want you to see is all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Who are those people? They are everyone whose name was not written before the foundation of the world in the book of life. It very clear who are those who dwell on the earth? They are the unsaved during the tribulation. Now, at the beginning of the tribulation, everybody's unsaved, right? So is it everybody on the earth? No, because many, many millions of those folks will come to faith during the tribulation. So you've got two groups. You've got everybody dwelling on the earth, and some are known as earth dwellers, or those who dwell on the earth, and others who are <coughs> dwelling on the earth aren't called that because their name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How do we sort those out? I don't. God will figure that out. <laughs> But my point is, anytime he references those who dwell on the earth, it's these who. It's that group. So the test is for those who are unsaved during the tribulation. That's what we see. So when we say, what is meant by, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world, I believe that is the tribulation period. Um, and we know that because that's what the tribulation is for, in part, is to try those who are unbelievers. And many of those who are start as unbelievers will follow Christ during that time. And they will cease to be those who dwell on the earth, and they will become those who are slain under the foundation, or under the throne of God, who cry out, you know, O God, holy and true, how long before you avenge our blood? So I believe that what this is, is the church, it's a, it's, a, it's a promise to this church and to us. The church will not go through the tribulation period. That's what's being stated here. This is a, there, there's argument within the body of Christ about when the, when the rapture would happen. Is there such a thing as a rapture? You guys know that we, we believe there will be a rapture of the church 
Um, when will that happen? Before the tribulation begins. That's called a pre-tribulation position. This is not why we believe it. It just helps validate what we already believe from other passages that are even more clear, even though that's pretty clear. <laughs> I'm not using it as a proof text, but man, I don't know how else you read that. And I'm sure there are people that could tell me, no, no, you know, it's like this because it fits the way they want it to be. But anyway, this is really one of those, when I started this, I said, guys, we really got to be careful not to bring what we think to Revelation and make it fit. We've got to take what Revelation says and take it for what it says. And this is one of those. This fits what I believe, but if I didn't believe that, I'd try to make it say something that it's not saying. And we've got to be careful not to do that. So let's move to what was Philadelphia doing wrong. And there's the whole letter um, to them. And I pulled the whole thing up because <laughs> as you read through it, I, I don't see anything. I don't see correction. Um, it's only the second church. It's, there's only two. Smyrna's dying. I mean, they're being put to death. And he has no correction for them. You might say, well, they don't need it. They're going to be dead in three days you know, or ten days or whatever, right? He doesn't tell these guys they're going to die. But he also doesn't have correction for them. And so what's this grand thing they're doing that's right? Obedient, faithful, really simple. These obedient, faithful folks are, he has no correction. Now, does that mean that there's no sin in the church of Philadelphia? I would say not because, you know, you've probably heard that saying that says, if you ever find a perfect church, don't go there because you'll mess it up. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Obviously, we're all sinners. Everyone is. And wherever I go, there's a problem because I just showed up. You know what I mean? And that's true of everyone. So these guys are not perfect. Clearly, there are things Christ could say, you know, you need to spend more time. You know, he could. He doesn't. I think that's important to note. We, we can get into the mindset of no matter how good I'm doing, you kind of have the voice of someone going, yeah, but that's not enough. <laughs> you can get that sense at times. And I want you to see that this imperfect, struggling, little power church is just, they're obedient, they're faithful, and all he has is good things. It's a, it's a pat on the back, you know. Don't lose sight of that. What was Philadelphia's exhortation? We look at this one every week. What, what's he instructing them to do? I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. So really, their instruction is just hold fast. Stand firm. Hang on. You're doing it. Just keep doing it. <laughs> Go ahead. Put your verse back up there. You notice it says, I won't, I won't, may seize your crown. He doesn't say he'll seize your salvation. Yeah, yeah. Rewards, not salvation, is what he's talking about. Absolutely. That's the next question. Because uh, I knew it'd come up. Good, good catch. What is meant by, so that no one will seize your crown? So, what's that saying? So, let's look at uh, 2 John 1 8. Watch yourself so that you may not lose what you have worked for. Pause. Did you work for your salvation? Can't be talking about that, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. These folks have worked for something. It isn't salvation, clearly. But may win a full reward. We actually spent... Uh, we did a series on this... Um, maybe two years ago, um, is really digging deep into this idea that we have a challenge, I think, in, in good biblical Christianity when we really get a grasp of the fact that we are truly saved by faith and not of works. It's totally destructive to that legalistic 
mindset that so many have either been a part of or been maybe raised with or have been you know at a church is like and we can go so far into this idea i'm saved by faith alone that it's like i get to live however i want to it doesn't matter my works are irrelevant which is not true that's not that's not true our works do not save us but they are the evidence that we are saved because <laughs> that's verse 10 of ephesians 2 8 and 9 that we always quote about by faith and not of works but verse 10 says um, but we're saved unto good works and we should walk in them so those who are truly saved have good works what happens with those works he says he rewards those works there is reward given for those and so that I think is what's being addressed here when he talks about let no one seize your crown Meaning you could get discouraged to the point of you're not doing those good works that he's laid out for you and you are not getting the rewards that you could have. And we've talked about that. I'll just make a really quick point on it. And that is that these rewards, I believe, as you study, are opportunities to serve Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. We will want more than anything we've ever wanted in our lives when we're perfect and without sin. We will want to worship God. It will be like a man who spent a week in the desert without water, if that were possible. <laughs> How thirsty is he, right? Every cell in his body is straining to get that glass in front of him. That's what worship of God will feel like. It will be an insatiable desire. And you have these crowns that you're given and you can give them back as an act of worship. You will want the biggest pile of crowns you could possibly imagine so you can worship and worship and worship and worship. And that's what he's telling us now. Get busy stacking up your opportunity to worship. It takes faith now to trust the fact that I really want to do that. He tells us we'll want to. And he's saying, you guys are doing a great job. Don't let him seize your crown. You're going to want those later. <laughs> it's really a great encouragement. I mean, his, and he knows he built us. He made us. He knows how much we'll want that and enjoy that. And this is an encouragement to them. Stay faithful. Keep doing what you're doing. You're on the right track. This last section. Zoom in on it. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven. And my own new name, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So each week we look at what is promised to the, those who conquer or the ones who overcome. We phrase it like what's promised to the overcomer. And we've talked about it before, but an overcomer is simply a Christian. We're told that in, I think it's 1 John, I've forgotten the reference. Those who overcome are those who have faith. It is simply a reference to believers. It's not super saints or anything of that nature. It's not a select group. So what's promised to the overcomer or those who conquer is, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out from it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God and out of heaven and my own new name. So that's a lot. He's really giving them, uh, I think, a larger measure of things to, to think about than he is in most other. I think that's also interesting. Again, obedience and faithfulness, encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going to take you out right before it gets bad. Don't lose heart. Keep, keep laying up crowns. Don't, don't be discouraged and start losing those. And when you finish well, I'm going to, and he starts unloading the truck on him of things that are, that are positive. So let's kind of walk our way through that. I'll give you that if you want to jot it down. I've kind of summarized it a bit. Made a pillar in the temple of God. Never shall they go out of it. The name of God, the city of God, and Christ's own new name are written on them. That is 
So it's really kind of three things. One is there'll be a pillar in the temple of God. Second, they won't ever have to go out from that. And third, they will have names written on them. God the Father's name, the new Jerusalem, the city, and Christ's own new name. Those three things will be written on them. That's what's being talked about there. So let's kind of walk our way through that. What is meant by, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. One thing about the city of Philadelphia, it was known for produce because there was a lot of volcanic ash and things in the soil. Um, whenever you have volcanoes that give you ash, you have earthquakes. <laughs> and so Philadelphia had been destroyed several times through earthquakes and rebuilding and earthquakes and rebuilding and earthquakes and rebuilding, right? And he, in this place only, talks about them being a pillar and the temple of my God. I think there's something there he gets about them and the instability of the life they're in and the location. And he's giving them this idea of being strong and in the presence of God. There's this pillar in his presence. Um, that's the reference itself. The answer I have for that question is they will have a permanent, you could add solid place with God. They will have a permanent place with God. And I think that also answers the shall never go out of it. What does that mean? That's pretty obvious, but um, I think that it's like uh, Philippi and the, the letter to uh, the, the book of Philippians is written to the church of Philippi. In that letter only, Paul says, you're citizens of heaven. Why does he say that in Philippi and not in Ephesus, right? He says that because they were the furthest out Roman colony and everyone born there was an automatic Roman citizen. It's a big deal to be born in Philippi. I'm a Roman citizen. So he took the very thing they were proud of and said, no, no, you're a citizen of heaven. He doesn't use that analogy anywhere else, but Paul uses it there. Again, there's one writer of the Bible, the Holy Spirit uses the same kind of word analogies over and over. And I think it's interesting that he uses pillar in the temple of God in the area that's known for earthquakes. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a permanent place with God. Then he says this, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven and my own new name. So what is meant by the writing of all these names on them? What's he, what's he communicating there? Um, any thought? Ownership is what I think. Yeah, I think that's it. It is a declaration of belonging to God. I had ownership and decided to change it to belonging. It somehow sounds better. I don't think of owning my kids, but they do belong to me. <laughs> um, I think it was John MacArthur talked about when he had little kids, and his kids are old enough to have grandkids or whatever at this point. So this was way back. He talked about they'd take them to Sunday school, and they'd have a roll of tape, and they'd write John <clears throat> MacArthur and stick it on the back of the kid, you know. That one's mine. <laughs> that one's mine. <laughs> so he used that analogy, and I thought that was good. That's just a good, it's much more tender sounding than getting branded with, uh, you know, a cattle iron or some, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it is ownership, but it's more about relationally belonging. Go ahead. In China, we got to put a red thumbprint on a paper. Yeah. Say, Our kids belong to us. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's really good. You could do that as a tattoo, like right there. That would be no, that's maybe India or something. I can't remember. Yeah. Well, no, they do that in China. Too. Oh, do they? Yeah. Anyway, it's yeah, it's this. Um, again, remember these people are being persecuted by the synagogue of Satan. Now, I dealt with that idea. The synagogue of Satan. It's in one of the other churches. He references that. To go back to that real quick, since I didn't mention it, these are not a 
Church of Satan thing. That's not what he's talking about. He calls it a synagogue. There's only one kind of synagogue. It's a Jewish place of worship. What he's referencing is there is one God, and you worship him the way he says to be worshipped, and if you don't, you are participating with Satan in false worship. So it doesn't matter if it's a mosque, or if it's a synagogue, or if it's a church down the street that denies the deity of Christ, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon. Um, if they deny the Trinity, and therefore a worshiping a false god, it doesn't matter which one of those that is, all of those would be churches of Satan. Does that make sense what I'm saying there? I remember once, this is probably several years ago now, I made the comment that there are, there are not gods that are competing. There's a god and everything else is Satan and his minions. And I had this look from several people like, and I was so disheartened. I thought, have I done such a bad job that people don't get that? So I've kind of pounded that point ever since. Um, yeah, there, there is not a panoply of gods and ours is the best. That's not how that works. There is a God, period. And there are multiple demonic, satanic forces that pose as angels of light. And the best place for Satan to hide is inside a church. Go ahead. Well, I don't remember. That. Sorry. <laughs> no, but it's like they don't know that. No, absolutely. That's the, it's the very offensive thing. what I yeah. just said. Yeah. Yeah. People. That's have why no I turn clue. comments off on YouTube. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They don't know no, that they, they don't. are a church of Satan because yeah. And, and I don't say that, by the way, this is a good opportunity to talk, I don't say that like nasty. I'm not trying to be mean, right? To be mean is to be dishonest. And to pat my Mormon friend on the back and say, I'm looking forward to seeing you on the other side, brother. That's, no. not, that's not nice. Now, how do, I, how do I do that? That's a struggle, right? That's... It's hard to figure out how you navigate that. And I get that it's difficult. But so, um, so it was interesting. I was reading a, um, a thing about how the different religions in the United States line up with the part, this is political, but it's parties that are, are for abortion and against abortion. And the very top one that was against abortion was a Baptist something yeah. in the United States. And the very bottom one that was almost all for abortion was another Baptist. And, you know, somewhere way at the top was Mormon. Mm -hmm. So they're you know, yep. against abortion. And right in the middle was Catholic. But I, it was really interesting that these yeah. two different Baptists, it doesn't sound like yeah. a, uh, uh, a whatever, you know, yeah. cult, right? There. Yeah. yeah. Let me Ooh, scary. throw scary. this out as you mentioned that. Um, I'm not a big fan of ripping labels off of stuff. Because you don't know what's in there, right? You know, you buy a can of green beans without a label and you might have something yucky like you know, lima beans or something, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, lima beans. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Or if you're from South America, lima beans. But anyway, you know, here's the point I'm making. When I drive down a, church, a road and I see New Haven Community Church, I'm making up the names, I don't think that's a real church. What do they, what do they believe? I have, I have no idea, right? So I have a little about Blackhawk. Blackhawk what? No, what, what do we, right? Blackhawk ministry, what do, what do we believe? I don't know. So I struggle with that, but what you just said is why I'm okay. If I say I'm Episcopal, you know what I think. There's a pretty set, thing, set of beliefs. Methodist, I'm here, right? Mormon, I'm there, I'm just, right? Baptist, what, what does that mean? <laughs> I have no clue. And I, I don't even think this is true, but it's a way of illustrating the point. Jesse Jackson and Jerry Falwell were probably both Baptist, and they don't agree on anything. Now, they may not actually both be Baptist, but they could be. I mean, that's how far apart, right? Pro-abortion, anti-abortion. I mean, you don't get different, more different than that. And they're both Baptists. So my point is, if you're going to rip off a label, rip off the Baptist one because it doesn't actually mean much. So that's why I'm not upset about the fact that we don't say Black Hawk Baptist. For one reason, and that is, along with that, 
there's a lot of really wild things that go on under the label of Baptist. And if that's your understanding of who Baptists are, I don't want that on the front door. Do you know what I mean? So it actually has negative, unjustified, negative kind of connotations that need to be ripped the label off. So, yeah, that's off topic, but it's something I, since you brought that up, uh, I thought I saw a hand. Let me see where I'm at, because I don't want to make sure we not finish. What? This is the last one. I have this, what pattern have we seen in these churches? This is last week we talked about it. There are less and less true Christians. This is the anomaly to that. You go from, so there's some of you who are messing around doing bad stuff. Then there are the rest of you are doing, and then you have, there's a few left who haven't soiled their garments, right? You get fewer and fewer Christians. And then at the last one, the next one, you have <clears throat> Jesus is outside knocking saying, hey guys, let me in. There's not even anybody left in the building that's saved, right? This is this strange anomaly. I mean, it's a perfect pattern. And then bloop, you got these guys. So what does that communicate? And I think it's interesting that this is the one church that he says... I'm going to remove you before the hour of testing. I think there is a pattern you see in Christianity as we move closer and closer to the end that there are fewer and fewer genuine Christians. But there is this one with little power, this little small enclave of faith that are really true. And all of the true believers in all the churches would be removed. So what I don't want you to hear me say is the good Christians get taken out before the rapture, or raptured out before the tribulation, and those few left at Thyatira hang onto your hat. You know that's not what's being communicated. But I I do think it's interesting that all the way up to the very end there is this pattern of decline in the church, but you've got this small group of solid believers. In, in multiple types of churches and they will be taken out. And I think that's one reason why it won't be obvious to the world that this was a taking of Christians <clears throat> at the rapture. Mm. The whole church is left. These guys only lost 10. Mm. Can't be that. <clears throat> this nutty one over here, they're all gone, but that's good. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's going to be these little... I don't mean like little in the fact that they're a small church with 50 people. What I mean is within the broader church, I don't think you actually have a high percentage of folks in the American I'm a Christian that are actually Christians. When they start digging down deeper in like a Barna study and you ask, are you a Christian? 70% yes. Do you believe? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? It's like 8% by the time you get to the end actually believe Christian doctrine. <laughs> it's like shocking how few there actually are. So that little, that little uh, power, I think there's a reference there that we can kind of latch on to. Go ahead. You mentioned 300 million Christians in China. Do you think there's a larger percentage of them that are true Christians true. Yeah. because they yeah. are persecuted? I wonder if it's yeah. because it's so easy for us that maybe the percentage yeah. is low where in a place like that. I, I would think yes. Um, <clears throat> if you get a call from somebody in America, um, and again, I don't, I'm not picking on the South with this, but it's just more still this way there. You know, America was a quote-unquote Christian nation 100 years ago, not because everybody was a Christian, but because it was the dominant culture. Culture, everybody went to church on Sunday because they understood that there's a God. They may not believe all of it, but they're on board for the general concept. That's still true in the South. I think you shared last week a song a lyric that kind of fits that. It talks something about not having whiskey on my breath on Sunday morning or something. But my point is, that was a country and western song. The point is, that's still very true in the South. So you get it, you live in somewhere in the Bible Belt, and you get a call from a um, you know, Gallup. Are you a Christian? Well, I ain't one of them atheists, you know? <laughs> no, no, sorry. 
sorry, that was bad. I should have done that. <laughs> you get my point, sorry. Apologies to all the people south of Mason. <laughs> That's not what I, yeah. So anyway, my point is, it's not that. It is that. That's the culture. Of course I'm a Christian. I'm an American. or You know what I mean? Yeah. But then when you start digging down deeper into it and you ask those kind of questions, it's, um, it, there, there's just that, that, that realness isn't there. If you're in China and you get a call, are you a Christian? Absolutely not. <laughs> I don't want to go to a camp, you know? Yeah. Like summer camp, no. Like, you know, <laughs> one with Constantino wire. I, I mean, you don't, you don't want to identify that way, right? So the only people identifying there are genuine. So I think that's very accurate that it's that way. Yes, I have offended 90% of the family who lives in the South. And I'll, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, go ahead. I just keep thinking, you know, he said all these things to these other churches. You've done this, yeah. you've done this, you've done this. And you know there were people in the Church of Philadelphia who have been through some of those same things. Yeah. Obviously, the same things are around them. Yeah. But they held strong and yeah. repented and went when they on. had yeah when they had bad things they repented and, yeah so uh, we, so yeah. there probably still were bad things in the church they just had yeah addressed them and yeah. got back on track yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That's, what I, that's what's in my mind no i think you're right cuz obviously they're not perfect they, they you know they got people there so they've got issues and but they're they're being obedient. And obedience isn't perfection. Obedience is doing what's right when you don't confess and get back to being doing what's right. The, the, the last line every week, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's just a, it's just a way of clarifying. This is for all of us. And we always end with, what can you learn from the letter to Philadelphia? Um, Last week I told you I think Sardis was maybe one of the most convicting because they weren't doing anything awful. They weren't doing anything great. They just didn't care enough to be good or bad. You know what I mean? Um, this one this is really encouraging because these folks aren't perfect, but he just lavishes on them. I just want to put my name on you. I want everybody to know your mind. You know, that kind of a thing. It's... I don't know. It's really good. I hope this one is encouraging more than anything. And then next week we'll end with people getting spewed out by <laughs> being lukewarm. But um, all right. So we have next week and then we'll have a week off for missionaries. And then we'll jump into chapter four, which is I know what you've all showed up for actually. Anyway, so. I was going to say on what can we learn? A strong faith actually gives you an acceptance, or not, not acceptance, that's the wrong word, uh, a reward of knowing he wants you in his family. Yeah. yeah. Something along that line. The, um, yeah, this idea of faith that is tested as though through fire is more <clears throat> precious than gold, right? Yeah. So if I say, okay guys, I've got some fire. Anybody want gold? Come on. There's not a long line for that, right? If you can get the gold without the fire, sign me up. But I don't want to walk into the burning building to get the gold, right? So God knows that, and he sends fire. <laughs> so, because he wants us to have gold. So, All right, let me pray for us, and we'll close. And uh, Dear Heavenly Father, we are just really grateful for your word, and I know, as I joked there a minute ago, that um, we're all excited about hearing the things that are coming in the future, these great and glorious things of you know, thrones and seals and bowls and all that. But Lord, <laughs> what rich truth you have for us in the sections that we work through to get to what we want to get to and then realize, oh my goodness, what, what treasure you had for us. We just ask that you'd help us to take the truths of these letters and help us to 
um, apply that to our lives. Let your corrective words hit home where it's needed. Let your words of encouragement strengthen us when it's needed. Help us as we see you more and more become more and more like you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name.